Welcome to the Eye on Annapolis Local Business Spotlight. There are thousands of locally owned businesses in the area, some small and some large. Some you may know and others you don't. But one thing they all have in common is a great story and we want to share it with you. Join us every Saturday as we talk to the founders, the owners, and the managers of local businesses you have come to know and love, and those you will come to know and love. Now here's your host, John Frenet, with this week's Local Business Spotlight. Not too often you get to do a podcast here at Quiet Waters Park, but we are here today, and it's a beautiful day, and uh, I guess we're in the dog days of August, July, and the hell, but we're here with Andy Schindling, who is the founder and executive director of the Complete Player Charity, which is uh, based out of Northern Northern Ireland County in Glen Burnie, right? Yep. Thank you for uh, taking time out of your day and your program here because you've got a whole group of kids that are down here at Quiet Waters Park to tell us, you know, to learn a little bit more about the Complete Player Charity. Now, do you go by an abbreviation? TCP? Yes. Oh, TCP is perfect. That's what people know us by. Um, I you know, first just appreciate you know, you having us on and the opportunity. Um, so, yeah, the Complete Player Charity was originally started in 2015 all around the game of baseball. So my background is I'm an athlete, grew up in Bowie, played, you know, all the main sports and really gravitated towards baseball, which led me to go to St. John's uh, College High School in Washington, D.C., or I guess a baseball scholarship, but they don't really say it that. Right. You know, Florist uh, ex- obviously excelled there, had a scholarship to go to George Mason. Um, however, I got drafted by the Orioles in the 16th round. And as a 17-year-old who loved baseball and dreamed of playing um, for Baltimore growing up, it was a no-brainer sure. to sign that contract. So I was a uh, in their minor league system as a pitcher from 2004 to 2009. What transpired through my time there is really what's led to why I do what I do with TCP, but that's where the name The Complete Player came from because I wanted to develop athletes into the complete player. Okay. Which was a, let's not just focus on the athletic side of things, but let's focus on the interpersonal and character development side of thing. Okay, and you work primarily with underserved youth. Yeah, so then it was all raising money for kids to play ball, then that turned into let's start teams and we'll help fund the teams and combine that with families that can pay and yada, yada. So it turned into a baseball organization. However, in 2018, we had a huge shift into what has led us into today, into the the mentoring, academic, enrichment, youth development space. I definitely can see where baseball is a um, a really good entree into leadership and getting, you know, kids of that mindset. And it's something special and something fun. Yeah, absolutely. What does TCP do? I mean, when a a kid enrolls, what's what's the program look like? I know it's a like a, a multi week program. Yeah, so it's very what we do. I guess is dynamic in the sense of during the school day, we we actually have mentors in the schools working with kids in math and reading, and that program is called academic and emotional mentoring. So that can look like. For instance, if we you came and visit a school, you would see Mr. Mark or Ms. Jess, Mr. Lucas in a class with a cohort of students working with them either individually or pulling them aside to work with them in a small group. And the idea there is um, helping these kids, one, just really stay focused. You know, majority of the kids we work with ha- have suffered multiple adverse childhood experiences and other traumas where they're coming to school with things on their mind that are prohibiting them to focus on their academics. Sure. So we're there to keep them on track, um, provide additional assistance if they're struggling with the topic. All right, they may, Mr. Mark, I need a little help. All right, you will sit down with them, talk through it with them, help guide them through getting the problem solved correctly and teaching them, you know, whatever they may be learning in that time during math or reading. Um, But also when when there are issues, and this is where I find and, and the schools are finding the most value is, hey, Mr. Mark, Miss Jess, I need somebody to talk to. Can can I talk to you for five minutes or so? So then, yeah, we we pull them out of class. We'll walk with them. They they we give them an ear to to lean on, provide them with you know good counsel and wisdom. And what 
we have noticed and the school have noticed is now they're coming back to class and they're actually paying attention more. They're, they're um, engaging in class, raising their hand. And it's, it's transpired into a lot of improvements as far as grades, um, participation, behavior with, with their classmates. And on a big scale, what the schools are telling us is it's transforming the whole grade level because now other kids are coming up to our mentor and say, Hey, can I be a part of this? Or can I, sure. can I talk to you? I'm having this going on. And me personally, what I've been able to do, you know, with the time I'm in there is if kids are expressing confrontations with other kids, then we're pulling both kids aside and sitting them down and saying, all right, look, you know, as you get older, Effective communication is key, and part of effective communication is being able to talk through conflicts with somebody. So right now, I want you, child A, to express what's on your mind, while child B, your job as a good communicator is to just listen now. And then we're going to switch. And what it's teaching the kids is how to overcome challenges and obstacles and confrontations using their voice in a proactive way. We can use that for adults, too. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and that's so it's very dynamic in the sense of our main objective is let's help these kids with math and reading because that's a huge problem in the county. And secondarily, let's help with the emotional side of things in your development that isn't going to be measured by data, but it's going to be felt inside the classroom. I can say, and I've got to imagine that talking to a member of your team or a mentor that you're going through is probably a lot easier for, and the children up there are probably no different than the kids down in Annapolis and, and other areas. I mean, they've seen stuff that you probably, nobody should ever see, They, you know, family situations and everything else. But I've got to think that talking to somebody that's not the, the teacher or the boss or not the principal or the counselor, absolutely, uh, to be able to sit there and go, you know, Andy, man, this a little Timmy, he's just pissing me off. Yeah, <laughs> no. absolutely. And, and it's also, it, it takes a lot of pressure off the teachers. Right, because teachers are focused on delivering the content, and you got little Andy in the back of the classroom acting a fool because he's got things going on, but it's diverting my attention to him, so I'm losing my focus. So it is a huge asset for us being in the classroom, but then having, you know, one of the students use our people um, in a way that enables the teacher to continue with the lesson and moving on. Well, teachers are undervalued, underpaid. And, Absolutely. And I mean, they're, they've are they got a job to do, but yet most parents, and I will in, probably include myself among this, think that like, hey, you got them from nine to three. You know, that, that you know, you are now a parent from nine to three. And that's so not the case. I mean, no. these teachers have a job to do and uh, they do it well. They uh, they make lifelong lasting impressions on the on their students. Absolutely. Um, and that's things. Well, you serve, how many kids do you serve? I mean, you're focused primarily on North County, which is Brooklyn Park and Glen Burnie. Um, yep. And a little bit of the West Side. Okay. Everything we mentioned is just one program. We also run after school programs as well um, at the elementary school level. And that program is the sports and STEM program. And that focuses on using sports to promote math. And the idea there is we're, we'll engage kids in physical activities, different sports. Um, one, just for them to flesh out all the energy they have, and then they may sit down and do worksheets. But the worksheets are tailored specifically towards the kids' needs. So what we do is, since we're in the class with them, we're seeing what content they're learning, we're seeing where they're struggling, so we're creating worksheets specific to that. Oh, wow. And then we also take them through the sport activity to collect data. So one day it may be shooting free throws, but every free throw is worth a certain amount of points. So then we'll use those that data. So they'll say, I shot one and I, I made it, so I got three points. I shot the second one, I made it. That one was worth five points. So the student has to add all of the point, add the points up. Um, so now they're working on math there, but then the mentors will then go create worksheets with the students' names and data. So now it's personalized. And that was one thing that, that I learned as growing up is when as an athlete was if math or anything was turned into a sport or related to sport, I was gravitated towards it. I wanted to do it. And if you threw my name in there and it was about me, I definitely want to do it. So we use that, 
that's our mode to make math relevant and meaningful to kids. Also, it's helping with the physical fitness, you know, getting them active. Um, you know, and they still have recess at the elementary school level, um, but it's it's shortened. It's not like it was when I was growing up, go play for an hour. Sure. Right. Um, so that's that's how we we utilize our time with the kids after school, and then we tie in character development. So every week there's a new character development word, trust, humility, integrity, ownership, accountability, and they're one we're giving them the opportunity. What does it mean to you? So they're they're defining it themselves, and then um, we challenge them throughout the week. Is here's the word of the week. Now it's on you to go demonstrate it. So. Then it's continuing week after week. We talked about integrity last week. Is the decision you're making right now reflecting integrity? Yes or no? And generally it's at a time where it's not. So we're, this is okay. We talked about it last week. You're struggling with it now, but that's okay. We're human, but what do we need to do to, to make a change? So then we're bringing those conversations up with them. At the middle school level, after school program is called the Young Leaders Program. And that's all about business and leadership and community service. Um, and then this past year, we tied in an all-girls program around aesthetics, and we also integrated a robotics program. So there was a huge need up there where there was kids interested in robotics, but there wasn't any program for it. So we've been blessed with um, a, a volunteer who that's the world he loves. So he came in um, for those 12 kids. He learned coding to build a make block robot that they had to code to do specific tasks to do a challenge at the end. Um, and some that were kind of like, eh, you know, I like the coding, but the robotics isn't my thing. Then we, we, we bought them an, um, a platform to, to learn how to code video games. So then we put them in teams where one person actually coded the video game, one person did the aesthetics of the video game, and then they worked together to create this pretty cool video, video game. That's cool. The aesthetics was our way of engaging girls and business, so they had to learn about different jobs in a spa. Um, so you had hair, you had nails, you had facials, you had the marketing, you had to understand the money. And then at the end of that, they had to produce an actual spa day. So we invited all the parents in and um, that got to benefit from what they learned. And it's, I mean, you're giving these kids such life skills. Oh yeah, and then we did woodworking. So we took kids over to the arts center uh, where they made cutting boards, step stools, and and single player planters. So they had to learn how to use all these tools, put it together, and then we turn around and use it as a uh, raffle item or auction item at our gala to raise money. Uh, and so the whole purpose of that program, one, is to show them these different workforce skills, develop these skills, but then the whole business side is they have to stand up and pitch a business plan presentation on an idea to improve the quality of life in their community in a Shark Tank style. So they're competing for a share of a thousand bucks, six hundred for the first place team, four hundred for second place. They get to keep the money, but I don't like conceptual. I like let's do. You know, my motto is you know don't talk about it, be about it. So if we're going to get you up on the stage to talk about something, we're going to do it. So we actually bring their ideas to light. So last year we stuffed. 300 care packages for homeless youth, 20 care packages for foster youth. We did two litter cleanups for a total of 150 pounds of litter. Then one group actually did a uh, concession stand at one of their basketball games to raise money for our local home, our, um, animal shelter. So the idea there is, hey, w what are some needs in the community? So now you're learning about the community. How can we critically think and come up with cool ideas to solve these problems and then put them in the position to do it. Cause I believe wholeheartedly is we need to develop servant leaders and teach these kids to find ways to serve their community. Sure. Whether you're in the highest echelon or the lowest echelon, it always feels good to serve people. Right. And there's always people out there to serve no matter our circumstance. So that was kind of, that's the idea of the business side is okay. One, you can put on your resume that, you created a business plan on an idea and you brought it to life. But more importantly is you're going to be comfortable speaking in front of people after you go through our program two or three times. And what's the, what do people fear the most more than death? Public, Public speaking, speaking, right? Sure. And what I've learned in life is those that rise at the top of, of the business or the, the company they're in, if they so desire, are the ones that are comfortable speaking. 
right? And it, because if you want to be a manager or you want to be an executive, you're going to have to present in front of people. So we're trying to really develop those skills within kids so when they get to college or they get to their junior, senior in high school, they've been on stages four or five times already. They're the ones shining now where others are kind of like, oh, no, I don't want to do that. You've got the, the next generation of leaders. Right. And then the summer camps that we do kind of just intertwine the after school programs, um, content, less business and more. And then we, we incorporate a lot more art. So okay. we're doing the art center with them or we're doing art activities, but just giving them a space to be creative. I mean, you know, me as, a, as an athlete, you know, I draw stick figures. So art wasn't my thing, right? But, you know, you give me a canvas to kind of paint on and or be able to do a collage about myself or, you know, things I'm interested in, then I can get some art done. So we just try to find out what their interests are as far as the the art aspect of it, and then we'll just get materials for them to go to town. How many students are you working with over a year? So fiscal year 24, which ended in June for us, we served 383 kids between all of our programs. So summertime, our camps are anywhere between 20 to 25 kids. Uh, This summer, actually, from June's, 17th August 16th we have a camp every week except the week of July 4th is there a cost to that not this year uh the last couple of years you know we've gotten a lot of funding um through grants through the school system uh I think all the nonprofits have been spoiled by COVID yeah. right um our intention is one you're never going to pay for an after school program you're never going to pay for in-school mentoring those that's what our bread and butter is and that's what we raise money for you know, moving forward with the summer camps, you know, we're, we definitely have to charge something. But you've got some expensive. I mean, I saw your van down here yeah. in the parking lot. So, I mean, there's a there's a van. There's yeah. gasoline that's uh, not certainly not a sheet ring. No. So, you know, we're going to have we're going to put a, a big push for a campaign to um, sponsor a camper or help provide scholarships. For us to run the camp you're at now is about eleven hundred dollars a kid. There, I, I'm not. Even if you could afford it, great, but it's a lot of money, right? So we're really trying to get that to where can we, and it's a two week camp. So can we get it to where parents are going to pay no more than four or 500 bucks and then we can sponsor scholarship the rest? The elementary school camp, I only want to charge parents a hundred bucks. Difference be, is because our, our elementary school camp is definitely serving more of the Glen Burnie, the Brooklyn Park impoverished families. Our middle school camp, has been brought into the general population the last couple of years to where I would say about 60% or more low income impoverished kids to where if we can get the, the families that can pay for it, we can scholarship the other ones in, you know, cause what I found is certainly I want to serve the impoverished kids the most, but what we deliver is for any income kid. Mm-hmm. Right. And I don't want to, push away and say, no, you know, this is only for certain kids because I find a lot of value in kids that come from wealthier families, working with kids from sure. poor families. All about diversity. And I've had wealthier kids come to me and say, Mr. Andy, I really didn't understand a lot of what these other kids have to go through. And I feel now that, now that I understand, I can help to do things to help these kids and the humility that some of the kids experience by realizing what they have compared to others in their community, I believe can help bridge the gap because I mean, let's be honest, if you're in Severna Park, you look at Brooklyn Park a little different and vice versa, sir. Right. So how can we be a catalyst to bridge those communities and say, Hey, Severna Park, you're probably going through the same thing. Kids in Brooklyn Park are going through. You may have more resources, but may look just a little bit different, different, but it's the same. You're still probably struggling with some anxiety or some depression or from peer pressure or what or mm-hmm. the culture. Let's bring you all together so you can say, you know, we're more alike than we are different. When you talk about the people, the mentors and stuff like that, I mean, how large is your organization as far as, I mean, do you have employees? Yeah. So last year was the first time I actually had more than one full-time employee. So we have four now. Um, and one uh, and two part time. One's actually going to move to full time. So we'll have Mr. Mark, uh, Mr. Lucas, Jerry, Omar, 
um, and Miss Jess, all in the schools full time, and then we'll have um, two more, two additional part times next year. Other than that, it's just me. So I've been run. I'll run the day to day myself. I have a great board. Uh, we have some, a lot of volunteers that act, that help as well, um, and great partners. So the aesthetics program was done with a partner, Candace Golden from Excellence Aesthetics, who is from the Brooklyn area. Mm-hmm. And then we're we're working with uh, another lady, Linda Lowe from Sisters in Sync, who's also helping to run a new all girls program next year. That's awesome. I'll tell you, man. I can just tell from talking to you that you live and breathe this crap. Oh, yeah. Where did your passion for this come from? What, why? Uh, uh, you know, I, I don't want to put words in my mouth. I mean, whatever. I mean, I know professional baseball is just, it's a very, very fine pipeline to get into the majors. For sure. And uh, right. most people don't. Yep. How do we make this jump? So, um, first, when I look back on my life, I always loved kids. And I have any of your own? No, I don't. Well, I guess I got 300, but um, I, to me, it sounds strange, but I was the 10 year old boy who was like, hey, let me hold the baby. And there was many of times where I, w- I was one of the only one in the room to be able to get this baby to stop crying. Like I would have parents, hey, Annie, can you hold so and so? They won't stop crying. Right. So I, growing up, I was just always attracted, you know, like I want to just nurture, I guess. I want to help. I want to support or whatever. And then uh, once I got the pro ball, I I started to understand the value of of the coaches that I had and and what my dad did for me as an athlete. And I told myself, if I make it to the big leagues, I'm going to, and I want to make $7 million a year because that's a million dollars a month. And I want to donate every other paycheck to a kid's organization. So my heart was there. Well, you know, you, you, you go through life and you make dumb decisions and, and you, you, you hang around the wrong people. So I pretty much led myself out of baseball. Okay. And once I got out of baseball, I got brought to the church, um, got baptized for the first time. And from that point on, it was uh, Jesus was like, this is what you're doing. And from that point on, it's I just started doing a lot of self-reflection. Um, I started reading about the adolescent brain. I started reading about youth development because I'm looking at my life like I was a, 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 a kid from the suburbs who had everything he needed, but got lost in life. How does that happen? And what really struck me was I read a quote that said, even a dead fish can float downstream and get somewhere. And I initially laughed and then I was like, oh, damn, I was a dead fish. And what that meant to me was I, w- I was floating through life going where life took me. I never really felt like I was in control. Like, yeah, I'm I'm going to school to play ball. I'm going to play pro ball. But I never felt like, you know what, this is my life. It was, hey, Andy, this is what you're going to go do now. Hey, Andy, this is what you're going to go do now. And I realized from the time I was 18 to 28, I was a dead fish, even as a professional athlete. So how does that happen? Right. And then once I started reading about the brain and youth development, I started understanding about emotional it developed in the emotional side, social emotional learning. And that's where I struggled because I had I had trauma in my household that caused me to not know how to make friends, not trust a lot of people, not to have confidence pretty much outside of sports. I say all I had to say is that's where the desire comes from because if I had everything I needed physically talent wise, but I didn't have the the social aspect, the emotional aspect. What about these kids that don't have either? You know, you're coming, you're coming into this. I mean, you're the Suburna Park kid. Uh, you know, if 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 you will, to, yeah. to the Brooklyn Park kid. I mean, you look like you had it all here. I mean, yep. you you know, you had what you needed growing up. You went to school, you had a potential career in major league baseball. You had had the same problems that that kid in Brooklyn Park that the kid yep. down here in the housing authority has as well. Trauma is not prejudice. No, it doesn't see colors, does it? No. And if you don't, what I've learned is if you don't address childhood traumas as an adolescent, it's guaranteed to carry on to you into your adulthood. Right. And that's what happened to me. So my drive is outside of sports, I didn't, I didn't have an identity. I was an athlete. My goal and, and passion is I want these kids to have an identity of I can 
be whatever I set my heart to be and whatever talents and capabilities I have, right? I don't want to tell a kid, yeah, you can go be an astronaut, but you don't have the the, the innate IQ to be an astronaut, right? Because then we're just telling them a, a, a false hope, right? But I want kids to say, you know what? All right, if I am an athlete, I want to be this outside of an athlete. And, I, and in order for a kid to say, I want to be this outside of an athlete, they need to know what's out there, right? And if we don't give, I had a lot of experiences, you know, I worked with my grandfather woodworking on cars with my dad. I always had things to do. Kids we serve don't, right? Because they don't have access to it or the parents aren't involved and engaged. For me, it's, I want to give all of our kids as many opportunities as we can to see what's out there so they can figure out what they're interested in, what they like, and then equip them with that emotional side of stuff. Because I'm a walking example of you can have all the talent in the world. If you don't have confidence and emotional intelligence, you're never going to reach your full potential. This is the, the story that needs to get out to these kids. And and I see it, you know, all over that. I mean, if you're, you know, in a bad situation at home, I mean, maybe your parents are not there, they're both working and you're taking care of your younger brothers or older brothers or sisters and stuff like that. You know, you've got to see the opportunity that's out there. And, you know, with some work, I mean, it's not going to be handed to you. You can do it. And I mean, it sounds very trait and like very cliche to say, oh, you can be anything you want. Mm -hmm. um, but you really can. You put your mind to it. Uh, figure out. I mean, if you want to be an astronaut and that's that's your dream and you don't have the the book smarts right now at this point to do it, well, you can get your book smarts. You can figure a way to do it. You know, maybe you won't do it. I mean, I'm, I'll, you know, I'll throw it back to you. I mean, you know, you had a dream of being a major league ball player. You know, there was a little bit of a detour. For sure. Um, yeah. To, you know, to do that. And we, I would all, say an early exit. We all, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's no, there's no birds or bag on this tour. <laughs> uh, but, you know, that to give the kids the opportunity and the hope. And I've always said that with kids that come from, you know, disadvantaged youths, that if the parents would just give a little bit more of their lives to their kids, to that, you know, hey, Andy, where, so are you hanging out with tonight? That be, I mean, I'm not sitting there saying you can or can. I just sort of want to know. Um, you know, just to have a little bit more involvement in the lives makes a huge difference, especially when you see a mentor in school that, cares about you, that's able to sit there and help you work through some problems that you have. Um, without having that at home, you know, it's, it's yeah, tough. That, uh, I mean, uh, to me, you hit the nail on the head. Well, and first, I'll say our our in-school program has proven to improve attendance with, with the kids we work with. Why? Because they know when they show up to school, their mentor is going to be there. And I, the reputation we've built with the schools is the one thing that I always hear when I ask them, what is the most impactful thing that we do as a program? All of them have said, you all show up. And I'm like, huh? You show up? Like, that's what we're supposed to do. No, Andy, you all show up every day and you're here and the kids know you're going to be here. That's the best thing you can do. Do you turn that around too to your mentors when they're in the school and the, and the kids don't show up? Do you hold them accountable for that? Do I hold my mentors accountable? No, no, you're the 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 kid participating in your brother. The kids like they, they don't show up. Hey, dude, where were you yesterday? Uh, absolutely, especially at the middle school. The 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 tough part about it is after you have to get to learn the kid first because a lot of the times it's because their parent didn't wake up mm -hmm. or didn't take them to school. Right. So we can't fault the kid, right? Um, but so back to your point is society, in my opinion, uh, us parents, and hopefully I don't offend people, but we failed our kids. We have failed our kids in this generation because we either work too much or we've been engulfed in technology just as much as they have. So we're physically present, but we're not mentally present. And I see it all the time. And it doesn't matter what communities, especially the impoverished community where they may only have one parent is... Hey, who are you going to hang out with? How was your day? Tell me about what you did in school today. Yeah, it's not you, there. You know, and that's and I think that is the biggest challenge. And I and you know, for us is why the kids have developed such strong relations with our mentors. Well, I also think that you you look at what the and I would hate to be a kid today. First of all, with the social media and with the, with everything else that's going on there. And and I'm of a different generation than you are. But when I was growing up, I mean, it was school was out. 
you run home, you throw your backpack on the bed, you get on your bike and you find some trouble to get into until your mom screams at it's dinner time. And then, right. you know, that, that was pretty much what it was. I mean, and we got into all sorts of trouble. Sure. Anymore now, we've really, I think, overscheduled our use and overpressured our use. Um, I have, you know, Severna Park apparently has one of the highest youth suicide rates in the nation. And nobody's going to convince me otherwise that it's not because the parents are just wanting, you know, you, you obviously want the best for your children and stuff like that. Okay. So, well, let's, okay. You need to be on the travel team for lacrosse and you need to be on the varsity for this. And you've got to be the honor roll, not just the honor roll, the principal's honor roll. And you, and there's all this pressure that comes on to there that, you know, the mind of somebody that's, you know, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 17 is not mm-hmm. able to, to handle. Uh, and that's where we get in, into a, into a situation. I mean, I think it would probably do a world of good to society. There's sort of, Tone it down a little bit. Step back. Agreed. And in the sports world, we need to stop telling kids you need to get a scholarship when you're in elementary school. I remember coaching T-ball and hearing a four-year-old mom say, oh, my kid's getting a scholarship. Your kid may not even play baseball. <laughs> There's a lot of development. Right. Here so there. not only is it the academics, but these kids are pressured severely of, hey, I'm spending tens of thousands of dollars a year. You better get a scholarship. So you got sports on top of academics and it's. It's adding to the to the issues goes to the Well, let's talk about sports. You've got a golf tournament coming up. Yeah, so we have our seventh annual tournament, uh, September 9th at Compass Point. Uh, this is a major contributor to our Brooklyn Park Middle School program. Um, so if you're available and you enjoy golf, you know, love to have uh, some more people come out. We have some exciting changes this year. So we have an on-course four-hole challenge that'll test uh, the approach shot that uh, will give some, the, the winner an opportunity. Actually, the winner will get up to 50,000 southwest miles for a flight. Nice. So that's, that should generally get you a round-trip flight. Um, we got a little different setup as well. Um, we do a chipping contest that's unique by using a certain type of uh, practice "Quote unquote ball." It's not really a ball, but they call it a ball. Okay. So we do a couple of things that you know others don't. So it's a little different in that aspect. Um, but yeah, registration is on our website tcpyouthempowerment.org, and it closes August nineteenth. Um, and we have about five foursomes worth of people left. Okay. So you're pretty much pretty. pretty cool. We're getting there. Um, that's kind of our soft goal. If we go over that, that'd be great. That'd be awesome. Yeah. yeah. Well, there are sponsorship opportunities available, I'm assuming. Yeah, we do have um, a silver sponsorship left. We have a gold sponsorship left. Um, our major needs right now are the beverage cart sponsors. We need two of them and a chipping contest sponsor as well as a dinner sponsor. And again, all that's at tcpyouthempowerment.org. Yes. Right? Yep. Awesome. Well, how can the community and the folks that are listening to this get involved with TCP, how can we support you? Um, obviously, we can golf. Yeah. Uh, I personally can't golf, but um, there's a couple ways to support. Um, you know, we we are going to be rolling out a uh, campaign for monthly donors because that's kind of the um, the, the backbone for nonprofits. Um, so monthly donors, you know, twenty, twenty five, fifty, hundred bucks a month. Um, you can kind of help us kickstart that before we actually launch the campaign. Uh, which will come later this year. If you're a business owner listening uh, or you're in a position to where you may uh, be able to orchestrate a field trip. So our middle school kids, we take on career exploration trips to learn about jobs. So those are hands-on experiences with employees during the workday. Um, we're definitely looking for some folks in in the robotics world, the manufacturing world, some of the trades, just to give them some new, fresh businesses. You know, we have a really good list of partners that are with us now, but, you know, you, you don't always want to hit them up every time and, sure. and annoy them. Um, so, yeah, that's an opportunity to help. That's, you know, giving your time there. Uh, we have a gala that we do every April, so there'll be information coming out um, in January on that. That goes down at the Black Wall Barn and Lodge in Odenton. If you want to come and just talk to kids um, in our middle school program about your job, what's your career path, your education path, what are some life lessons you learned? Well, that's full. We definitely um, are looking for that. 
if you have a, a son or daughter that's in uh, going to be a rising junior or senior or in college in the next couple of years, we offer internships and volunteer service learning opportunities, be mentors for the kids during the summertime. And then this year, we're going to be rolling out multiple uh, litter cleanup days in Brooklyn Park. Um, it's a very litter heavy community, um, which, and it's also a community that has some of the poorest air quality in the county. Right. So we're really trying to, you know, make a change there. So we'll have those, you can volunteer, you know, I know there are businesses that like to do one day things for their employees. And if you really want to make a deep impact and you want to volunteer as a mentor for 12 weeks, I know that's a big ask. <laughs> uh, no, it's not. I mean, when you look at the, any number of people that are maybe retiring or maybe cutting back or something like that, because yeah, again, I think that you look at the difference in the age, you know, old, old and young is probably just as valuable as the, the wealthy and the poor and the, the black and the white and everything else. Sure. I think you sit there and be able to see that. And I imagine that you would not turn down money. No, no. <laughs> you know, if, if you're somebody that at the end of the year, you, you're passionate about kids and you want to invest in local youth. Yeah. You know, tax deductions at the end of the year are great. You know, I will say we, you know, coming off of last fiscal year going into this one, we have a $300,000 gap we got to close uh, to continue offering all of our programs for free, including the summer camps. You know, so a donation, you know, anytime throughout the year would be great there. I would personally say, and this is how this is why I tell everybody, if you want to give money, thank you. I'm very appreciative. But come see what we do. I don't want to be somebody that you just give money to and you don't actually see where your money's going. I want you to meet the kids. I want you to see my mentors in action. I really want you to understand where your money's going. You do want to see that your money is doing well. I mean, I don't want to diss on some of these national organizations, but I mean, I would much rather give $100 that's going to buy three basketballs for kids to be able to play in the afternoon in the sports in the sports league than I would give that same amount of money to, we'll say, like the Red Cross or the mm -hmm. National Capture Society, where not as much goes right to the program and affects us in the community. Yeah. And our kids are so critical to our life. They are. We have, we have to support them. Yeah, I agree. And a relationship is a two-way street. Right. And I look at all of our donors and supporters and volunteers as a relationship. So that's why I really encourage to come out. Don't I, I hate asking for money to begin with. Right. People work hard for their money. So I don't want to be the person where it's like you only hear from me once a year or I only hear from you once a year. It's like let's actually build a relationship because that's how that's how we can make a change. Right. Um, and, and, and to come see the program. You know, that that was even before, even if you don't want to give, come check out what we do. That's what it's all about, making a change in the community. And it starts uh, out real young with the Complete Player Charity and uh, tcpyouthempowerment.org. It's a kind of long URL, but it's a really appropriate one, I think. In addition to the tcpyouthempowerment.org, I'm assuming you're having all the socials, too, as well. Yeah. So the Facebook and Instagram handle is at tcpyouthempowerment. And our X handle is at TCP underscore YE. I want to thank you so much, Andy Shindling, for your time. Uh, more importantly, I want to thank you for your vision to bring this to, to here and what you're doing for the, the kids in North County. And for those that are listening, go out and definitely check it out, tcpyouthempowerment.org. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to this week's Local Business Spotlight. Please make sure to visit ionanapolis.net for all your local news, events, and opinion. And in case you haven't already, please subscribe to the Ion Annapolis Daily News Brief, where we bring you all the day's local news direct to your phone, tablet, or computer in about 10 minutes. It comes to you at 6 a.m. every Monday through Friday, and you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.